This is Moment Tonight. Welcome. Many thanks for joining us. We bring you the real stories. I'm done now. I'm done now. Have you put the pen in the My environment. I'm rich. I've chosen to be one of the very shallow persons. They also do have miscreants, but it doesn't mean that all of them are criminals. We do not have a good job database of our mineral resources. This is a time for us to share the oil money. So terrorism is not going to be accepted on this continent. If they see them coming here and going back, they'll be killed. But God willing, I'll be back alive. On the night patrol with the AU forces here in Somalia. The real issues, the real talk. We are working together for the development of Ghana. It means that we have separation of powers. Really, we're talking about moving from what? A deficit of 9% to 6.5%. The critical challenge that faces every is the issue of creating jobs. We will put at least one million people to work. Ghana, after 16 years, has a public structure that is not responsive. Join me, Abdul Hai Moment. The men tonight, from Monday to Friday, 8.15 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. on GBC 24. To welcome you to BBC 24 and tonight we take a look at um, uh, one country that has had relations with Ghana at least for the past 60 years and uh, we'll be looking at uh, issues that have come up in that country and also how those issues are likely to affect Ghana. Now it, two years ago millions of Turkish citizens gathered in Istanbul's Yeni Kapi Square near the shore of the Sea of Marmara for a roaring celebration and victory against plotters who had uh, in the, uh, planned a coup. Now, in the aftermath of the failed coup attempt on 15 July, 50,000 people have been remanded in custody and 170,000 suspects investigated for links to the shadowy group believed to have masterminded the coup. Now, uh, tonight, I will engage the Turkish ambassador to Ghana, Her Excellency Nesrin Bayazit, to discuss issues pertaining and how they are likely to affect Ghana as well. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank Always you. a pleasure uh, having you for company. Thank I'm excited you. you accepted our invitation here this evening. Thank you very much. It's been exactly two years. In fact, two years. Sunday the 15th was exactly two years since that failed coup attempt. And naturally, uh, my first question, uh, before we even get into the details of any other discussion, to you would be, what do you remember? Of uh, as I was explaining in your previous program, I was in Ankara that night with uh, my family and we were trying to, we were getting ready to go for holidays, but suddenly we started hearing all these uh, planes uh, flying low, and then bombs and fire, and we couldn't understand this. We just thought that it was a terrorist attack. Actually, it was mm. a terrorist mm. attack in another mm. uh, form. So uh, then we turned on the TV and we saw that you know, this was the coup attempt. Actually, uh, since then, now uh, the second year, uh, there are so many evidences and there are so many statements of the witnesses which makes it uh, sure that the, the origin of this uh, failed coup, uh, you said that uh, a shadowy group, and this group is called in Turkey, uh, we, we recognize them as a terrorist group called Fethullah Gülen's, uh, Gülenist uh, terrorist group. Better, uh, for the sake of conversation. And these people were uh, you know, recruiting uh, children and their parents through education. Uh, actually, that is the main line of it. 
And uh, that night, uh, 251 uh, Turkish citizens lost their lives because it has never been any in, in Turkey. We have had our coups, but we never had a bloody coup like this one, that they were just shooting civilians, innocent people. Uh, also wounded uh, above 2,000 people. So we do commemorate these people who lost their lives uh, now on the 15th of July. But at the same time, we call this day now Democracy and National Unity Day, because as you referred to yourself, it was such a, uh, such a, a dramatic night uh, that uh, later on, uh, people from opposition, people from uh, ruling party or uh, everybody came together that uh, Turkish democracy is worth uh, defending. Mm. And uh, of course, this was a coup attempt against the democratically elected government and especially president. Our president was elected by direct vote previous year. So all this uh, issue, uh, of course, led to <coughs> uh, which you called uh, investigation of the people and many people were arrested and then uh, there were trials and released some people uh, were dismissed it, it has been a traumatic experience for Turkey I have to say that mm. but in the two, two years now uh, we see that we are getting uh, in a, uh, on a better course and uh, it's so important to first secure national uh, national security uh, without that it's very difficult uh, in a country of yeah. 80 million people uh, i remember in our same coup last year you did talk about your own personal experience where you were and where the president was at the time when it happened but i want us to look at specifically and later we'll come to the issue of the group that you say uh, has been identified as being behind the field coup attempt. Uh, I'd like us to talk about what evidence you have according to the witnesses and so on. But before we get there, so economy, uh, general life in Turkey at the airport and so on, how was life affected well, by the coup? Uh, the, the coup attempt, of course, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, when uh, uh, such a thing happens in a country that you have your in foreign investors and the situation of your own domestic economy and also all those people who were sacked uh, from the uh, state offices, offices, uh, it, it is it's a difficult experience to put every back, everything back to normal. So that's what we experience. Uh, economy did didn't do as bad as it was predicted. Actually, uh, we have uh, the, one of the highest level of uh, growth uh, in Europe, among the European countries. And uh, s uh, many schools were closed because they belonged to this uh, organization. And uh, somehow even the foreign students, they were affected because uh, but we found them other universities. So the idea is uh, has been uh, you know uh, an overall campaign to get rid of these people so that this will never happen again uh, in turkey or any other country so uh, in spite of that now we are building the big airport uh, one of the biggest the biggest airports uh, in, uh, which will be open in 2019 yes it will open. no no this year in uh, october october this year yes yeah, yes it yes it will be our national uh, close to our national day mm. and of course we tunnel, Euro-Asian uh, tunnel, and we, uh, we built one of the longest uh, bridges uh, which is connecting uh, uh, some, uh, is uh, the Gulf to another part of Turkey. So uh, infrastructure projects haven't been affected mm -hmm. and we are, we keep on uh, bettering our system and uh, I mean we did finish our uh, metro lines, underground lines, so it didn't uh, really shake us so much, but mm. uh, of course uh, uh, there were some persons, their jobs, uh, many things happened, but it was on the evidence and uh, everything, every action taken was really based on the, of course there were some, uh, some cases that people were uh, wrongly accused, 
But those people were released after that because uh, with uh, the evidence is the statement, evidence is the night of the coup attempt, how the uh, security cameras, uh, and then of course people who are becoming, you know, they, they just want to uh, make a deal mm. uh, so that they can get less uh, punishment. Mm. And uh, I, I think many people are talking about uh, being harsh on these people. I don't understand this. I mean, how could you let people go if they try to uh, take over? Well, uh, uh, Your Excellency, we'll get to the issue of okay. uh, the harsh punishments in a while. Uh, but let's look at the evidence. Um, two years on, on authority that the Gulani movement is to blame for the coup. Where is the evidence? Oh, the evidence is, uh, first of all, it was traced through their uh, secret communication system. They, uh, they created uh, uh, some, some uh, apps, and one is called Bylock, and uh, one is called Tango, one is called Eagle, and all these uh, communication lines also gave the evidence to of the uh, communication authorities, and this is one evidence. The, na the night of the coup attempt also, when you see the general staffs uh, inside the building, you also see the movements. I mean, everywhere you have CCTVs, mm -hmm. and uh, so you see them. And of course, the financial records, uh, you have the, uh, this organization has been around a long time. And uh, they owned media houses, they owned banks, they, I mean, they were acting like a mm -hmm. So these people uh, had a way of, I mean, uh, if you, have, you are such a big organization, there is no way that you will be secret all the time. In December 2013, they started first time because they were eave eavesdropping uh, ministers, even the then prime minister, our president. Uh, so uh, there were many, many things going on. From then on, 20, uh, uh, 2013, they have been uh, followed also, uh, whatever means. So it's not, it didn't happen one night that uh, everybody discovered this organization is a menace. And uh, there were many people pointing at, uh, to d pointing at this truth, but they were also prosecuted because of their media houses. They were uh, forming, uh, shaping opinion in Turkey also. Mm. So it was a, it is, it has a long, it has been a long process, and uh, without, uh, you know, of course, by other uh, countries or our allies. But I think now they are also understanding the uh, seriousness of this issue. Mm. That's why we see uh, over hundred of these people who uh, went uh, abroad now brought back to Turkey. Mm. Two years ago, when this happened and uh, debate raged on and on as to what could have caused uh, some persons to attempt a coup d'etat in Turkey and so on, one of the arguments that came out strongly was the fact that the Turkey but in actual fact, exit democratic and evidence that is seen, as argued by your critics, the critics of your government, is that you don't even allow media freedom. That could have been one of the instigators of this attempted failed coup d'etat. You agree? Uh, of course, I don't agree, and this is not uh, a very solid argument because. Uh, you had journalists who, uh, who were uh, prosecuted or who were uh, put into prison. Uh, the reason was not uh, doing their job and reporting. The reason is because we have some uh, laws, restrictive laws on terrorism. So there are certain issues that if it's against national security, you cannot report it. I mean, everybody knows that we have these laws. And after that, of course, uh, the after the coup attempt, very shortly we, uh, there was a declaration of state of emergency. This is emergency. So uh, normally I, I wouldn't uh, call uh, undemocratic Turkey. Mm. But of course uh, there are times that you have to restrict certain things. And this was one of the times. And I'm happy to uh, tell you here that uh, on the 18th, this state of emergency will be removed now. Mm. So it also shows you that 
we are 18th getting, of July. 18th of July. Or a year, uh, two years after. Almost. Two years and two days. More or less. Okay. Because mm. uh, it was a process, legal process, right. you had to get to mm. the state of emergency. Mm. I think it was a, a month or two later than the coup attempt. You have told us uh, that some of those who were investigated and found not guilty were released. But we also know that when people are accused of crimes, there's a certain stigma that comes with them, even when they are later found not to be guilty. Uh, for such people reintegrated into the larger Turkish society without any fear from the people. I think this is, uh, of course, these things happen, but this was not, they didn't, I mean, some people were, uh, they, they, they were not sentences. Mm -hmm. This was the process, process of looking at the, at the evidences and uh, witness statements. And then uh, usually the cases related to, you know, they were so clever, they, uh, they invented another app. And that app made it possible for an ordinary user to show their ID number, something like that. So some people, although they never use Bylock, for instance, if you brought your telephone for a service or something mm. like that, it was possible to get some sort of connection. So th that was the main reason why, uh, one of the main reasons why people were prosecuted. But uh, later on, of course, uh, you, you, uh, there are mechanisms. Turkey is part of the U You can go to the European, uh, Court, uh, European Court of Human Rights. You can go to, we have other mechanisms. And we have also a commission in Turkey, those people who complained uh, for being wrongly uh, prosecuted, uh, applied to that commission. So I think mechanism, although it is the state of uh, emergency, still there is a, there was a mechanism, and it's, this will continue after state of emergency mm. is lifted. Maybe there will be more people complaining about or uh, wrongly uh, prosecuted. But this will be a legal process. And we will see in due course, uh, you know, it's not, uh, they were not really uh, ousted like that. And when you are uh, cleared, you are cleared. Yeah. Uh, in Ghana, we, and I believe the same in Turkey, our uh, laws say you are innocent um, until proven guilty. But the reports that we got from Western media about the happenings in your country at the time was that and human rights abuses against many of the 170,000 suspects that were under investigations. You have just told us that people can take up, you know, actions if they feel that they were wrongly, uh, you know, prosecuted or whatever it is. But were there excesses? Uh, you mean what? Were there any wrongdoings on the part of the government in terms of maybe some human rights abuses and so on on the part of the government in trying to deal with the matter mm -hmm. actually uh, as i said earlier this is a uh, this is a process and this process is watched by of course our european allies also so uh, one 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 should not forget this uh, the uh, power of this organization because they are all over the world. They have schools in 160 countries, and they have businesses, whatever, you mm. know, including Ghana. Uh, so these people, they are so powerful in those countries, they also try to manipulate uh, as if this is from one center. You can see, for instance, Gulen has articles in, uh, in uh, Le Monde, in New York Times, I mean, uh, he couldn't, he couldn't possibly write those articles. So there has been a center of information. How, how do you mean he couldn't possibly? He's, he's well educated. He's, well, he's, uh, I believe. Uh, well, well, he's well uh, educated. He, he has um, one lycée, uh, I, I mean, not, not university degree even. He's self taught and he's a religious uh, preacher. Is that what is the education? I mean, that's something I don't want to get into. A, mm, right, a I, I, I do understand that. But, yes, uh, this is uh, mm. that is debatable. Right. Okay. So, no human rights abuses. I you can never say if you have such a the, such a uh, big thing going on in the country 
I mean, how could we expect being hurt? I mean, it could happen. There could be isolated cases, of course. But it's not a sort of orchestrated campaign of human rights abuses. And on the other hand, uh, mostly these people who were uh, disciples of uh, Gulen, they came from our security forces, from our army, from our military, and uh, it's also the uh, internal uh, security. So you didn't even have so many people to handle the case after all. Um, I'll use Ghana's uh, political history as an example to uh, ask my next question. Whenever coup d'etats have happened in Ghana, whether successful or failed, the reasons assigned by the coup plotters was usually, on top of the list, was corruption. What is it, sincerely, that this group was looking for, which the government wasn't providing, so much so that they had to attempt a coup? I think, uh, like I said earlier, Turkey also has experience in coups. But th those were all military coups in, uh, mm. in certain ways because the economy was doing very bad. I remember 1980 coup, and uh, we had almost civil war in Turkey between left and right and uh, fractions of the political spectrum. And there was an instable, uh, unstable uh, environment. And the schools were bombed, people were killed in the streets. So there was a reason for the attempt. We don't see any reason as such. I mean, uh, that's why people did not back it. That's why people went to the uh, Yeni Kapu, as you mentioned, and the op opposition or ruling, they were just coming together mm -hmm. and uniting in protecting the democracy. So the idea here was to take power, to capture Turkey, and uh, rule uh, in the way they want to uh, rule. And uh, Mr. Gulen, he had been exiled. He was not exiled. You know, he could have come to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were many calls from the ruling party asking him to come back and serve in the country and things like that. But it is just uh, a matter of because first uh, they uh, they put this uh, in, uh, indoctrination in the minds of people by providing them schooling and money and then uh, jobs. They were uh, exam rigging, I mean, all the state jobs. That's why uh, to go and uh, get, uh, they, they, they should mm. leave the state, uh, because there, there are evidences. If you look at their exam papers, I mean, they all got hundreds, mm. <laughs> which is not possible. So this is a, it was not one, one night or 10 years, it's, it's 40 years mm. stage mm. thing. And of course, uh, it has some foreign uh, assistance o in the whole issue. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we'll, we'll get there. But um, Turkey offers opportunities for Ghanaian students to study for master's programs, for PhD programs. You've said here that some Ghanaian students were affected by the coup, but they've had to be, you know, re established in other universities and so relocated. on. Uh, relocated, yes. Uh, again, um, we know that when situations like this arise, investors tend to have, you know, some concerns going to invest in the coup or an attempt. Tell me, so for those Ghanaian students or Ghanaians who intend to study in Turkey as we speak, how safe would they be? Should they go ahead with the process? And for any investor from Ghana or from other parts of Africa, how safe will their investments be in Turkey as we speak? Well, I think uh, this was, uh, I mean, now after two years we are talking and we have achieved so many projects and we are continuing investing. We didn't lose uh, foreign direct investment at all. Uh, the, of course, you will always have one or two people who are concerned, more concerned than the others. Mm. But uh, in the Ghan uh, case of the Ghanaian students, for instance, uh, mainly these uh, students were brought by these people to Turkey, and they were placed in their universities. And when their universities are closed, then uh, we didn't want them to be out in the cold. That's why uh, we re relocated them into other universities. We have a foundation now, it's called 
a Turkish Marif Foundation, it, that means Education Foundation, and now they have been, uh, I'm, they were established in uh, June 2016. Mm. This was a month before the coup attempt, because uh, the schools and everything was under investigation before, mm. before the coup attempt. So this uh, Marif Foundation, now they have been taken, uh, taking over schools from uh, the and they are also uh, establishing new schools. So in uh, over, uh, they established in 21 countries, 108 schools, and uh, they also have uh, like more than 10,000 students. And now I'm also happy to tell you that we have a newly appointed uh, representative of the director of the foundation uh, for Ghana. So they are also going to look into the possibilities of uh, here, uh, because education is the most important thing. Uh, you know, it's just uh, for any uh, developing country, developed or underdeveloped, education is the key issue. So we will be happy in any way if we can contribute to Ghana's uh, human resources uh, through education. Interesting, uh, uh, but uh, I was privileged that on the day that Turkey went into presidential elections, I was in Turkey at the time, and I uh, found the process, at least from my perspective, to be very smooth. Uh, I was particularly paying attention to reports on TV to see if I would hear of any skirmishes. I didn't hear of any. Uh, tell me. How did the presidential elections go for you? How was it organized? And um, if you would, maybe the media in Turkey didn't report it. Were there any protests? Do you know of any? Well, actually, there were uh, loads of hordes of uh, international observers. So it is observers. So it was not uh, only Turkish media. You had all the international media, this and that. Uh, there were a couple of small incidences at certain ballot boxes about closing time or taking stock of it. But I haven't uh, heard any physical uh, skirmish or anything like that between the uh, oppos opposing parties. Our elections, you know, usually they are very peaceful and they are transparent. The results are coming in two, three hours because of the technology, mm. you know. Mm. And you don't even have that tension that goes yeah, until I, the and morning. That, that's one thing that uh, struck me uh, because I was, it was on a Sunday, and so as, as I calculated that the earliest time results could come in would be maybe Tuesday morning. No. And by <laughs> Sunday, 8 p.m., we are told yeah, what, what the less, results yes. were was in charge, uh, I mean, who was in the lead, and President Erdogan uh, won convincingly. Is that an endorsement of the fact that this coup attempt was baseless, as you've always been saying? Yes, that is, that's one thing. But the other thing is, our president has been very popular in Turkey and abroad also. Believe me, I received so many congratulations messages from Ghana, mm. all the parliamentarians, all, even the uh, ordinary organizations. Here, a strong Turkey, and Turkey uh, has voted for a strong uh, president. So uh, this is the second time with the direct votes of people our president uh, has been elected. So uh, it also shows you that the uh, population of Turkey wants stability. And the most important thing is continuity and security. That's why he came very strong uh, out of the elections, uh, though his party lost a bit, uh, bit blood. But the president is very popular, and he has a very good click with people of Turkey. So this mm. is a, a transparent, democratic, peaceful uh, elections, and I don't think that people could dispute that because the opposition conceded immediately they didn't uh, take this to any uh, further anywhere you know they didn't oppose to the results okay so you talk about president Erdogan. Um, he says he easily clicks with the people but he doesn't appear to click with Erdogan. i'm talking about the u.s for example and then also um i'm talking about uh turkey's 
foreign policy. And so you received messages from all over Ghana and abroad congratulating you. But is, is it global that you are struggling to join the EU, for example, uh, if the goodwill was would have accepted Turkey long ago. Yes, but you know, I think it's not a matter of goodwill. It's a matter of uh, give and take. It's a matter of uh, what's happening uh, on uh, international uh, global uh, scenery. I mean, after Brexit, mm. if you look at the situation mm. now, uh, it's not very uh, appealing to join the European Union and m many, con uh, many countries within the Union are talking about the meaning of the European Union. Mm. A strategic choice. We have been uh, a partner of European Union a uh, uh, long time, so uh, there is no justification that uh, we will not get in one day, but we have to see uh, how things go. You know, we, we negotiate, we stop, mm. we restart. This is like a uh, like a, a difficult marriage, <laughs> so it goes on and off, and mm. we are just. Uh, but uh, but of course, uh, when you look at what's happening in Europe, uh, xenophobia, uh, racism, and Islamophobia, mm. they are uh, on rise, and all the right parties are gaining ground. So that will not make it easy because Turkey is seen as an alien culture because mm. mostly our population, uh, we are Muslims. Wow, okay. So there's a cultural, uh, cultural there's a concerns. Cultural, but I find uh, Turkey to be very secular. Yes. It's a very secular. So which part of the, as uh, which aspect of the culture uh, are, are people concerned about? Well, because I think maybe there are many people they don't know Turkey uh, closely or truly or they are not interested. But also you have to uh, think uh, the, how we inherited from Ottoman Empire because it was a big empire and they were all, uh, all over the, uh, I mean, in three continents at least, a big empire. So we are, uh, as the inheritors, inherited a lot of issues. And uh, I mean, um, predominantly a Muslim population, but a secular, uh, it's not, uh, I, I think it's uh, something I am proud of that we achieved what we achieved. I actually today. found one of the biggest churches I've ever seen mm. in Turkey. Yes. Um, yes I've forgotten the name of that square. Uh, it's a I big market square. <laughs> I, I can't remember, but uh, it's, it's a Catholic church uh. that is there and, and it's big. And uh, I, I, I person who is very happy living in Turkey and that's why talking about the cultural differences and difficulties being a result of which uh, is contributing to the difficulty for the EU to accept Turkey I still find it a bit um, because of my little experience but let's let's get to how eager you are as a country to still join the EU, following the fact that she's leaving. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's also, we haven't uh, given up. We are not saying that we are not going to join the European Union, but uh, the, uh, the scenery is changing. Of course, less people are uh, for joining the European Union. And after all, all these years, uh, since 1963, Turkey has been treated very, uh, how should I put, uh, very uh, impolitely. And I mean, it's a big country with. Look at the present members of the European Union. Some of them, I mean, you cannot even compare them mm. with Turkey. So this is also our size. We are a big country, like we will have the same votes like France, Germany. Well, Britain is not there anymore. Mm. So there are issues also with the small countries like Austria. I mean, uh, there are issues like uh, with uh, anything, you know, th there are many things. All this uh, migration or uh, illegal immigration, and Turkey is uh, at the cross of Europe to sort out this problem because we are ending up with uh, almost 4 million uh, refugees mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm. So it's not easy life, uh, but uh, European Union, Turkey will only 
bring uh, additional value to the European Union. Mm. We are not going to be burdens on them, but still, as I said, politically, maybe you are not aware of so ma so much the European issues, no. but there is there has always been this uh, this uh, uh, this fear. Because mm. uh, they saw first the Ottomans coming into Europe, and uh, Ottomans managed to go until uh, Vienna, you know, because the, all this uh, Istanbul used mm. to be a, a capital of Greek Orthodox. That is the church you are referring mm. to, probably Saint mm. Sophia mm. is uh, that one. You know, there are many civilizations uh, they, they lived through uh, in Turkey and around Turkey. So we are, uh, I mean, we have never been defeated by any other nation. That's another mm. this time. Mm. Okay. Um, foreign policy. Uh, what's, what's, what message, <coughs> what's the key message that Turkey wants to send out to the world and to Ghana in particular? Well, uh, first of all, our uh, found, uh, founding father, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, mm. This was the uh, this was the his saying. I mean, he showed a target to Turkey, saying that peace. This is the motto of our foreign policy. So to achieve that, we try to help and try to sort out the problems around as much as we can. Especially in Africa, we know that uh, Turkey, this part of Africa, Sub-Sahara. We are a, a newcomer in this part, but we are he helping a lot with development projects. It's not, uh, maybe Ghana is not getting as much as Somalia or some other mm. countries. So uh, this, is, this is one way of putting it. And uh, we are uh, trying to help education, poorer uh, or uh, mo more uh, uh, needy people to, uh, to through some projects. Uh, I think it, uh, we, what we want to do is we want to have a, a partnership, not just giving and uh, taking, but just uh, being a partners and trying to uh, transfer our experience on, because I think uh, Turkey is a good uh, close example to Ghana, I, how we developed fast. Mm. So this could be one of the... Mm. I'll come to the Ghana uh, specific related issues, but um, was in 2016, Turkey hosted the World Humanitarian uh, Summit. Um, issues of refugees came up. And indeed, Turkey, at the time it came up, was uh, hosting some of the most number of uh, refugees in, 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 in the world. Uh, you have the Nezip refugee camp, yes. which I had the uh, two years ago. But tell me, beyond the humanitarian summit and after it, what has Turkey benefited? Oh, well, we uh, really, it's not, uh, Turkey is not benefiting so much. It's just because you are spending so much money also to, for overseas development aid. And uh, Turkey is after USA, uh, if you compare uh, per uh, capita of income, is country uh, providing aid and this is uh, this is not uh, only in Africa we have uh, other projects uh, for instance I will just give you an example when uh, in Myanmar when uh, Rohingya Muslims Turkey mm. was the mm. first country mm. to take up the coast and bring them uh, help assistance uh, bring them uh, you know also bring this to the international uh, agenda it's like the Palestinian case. We are the uh, leading country in taking actions and trying to make this an issue with the United Nations, you know, uh, trying to get uh, those countries who wanted to just uh, implement their own agenda, but there, there is an international situation here. So our, uh, our interest in all these issues are mainly those people who are not uh, treated uh, according to uh, the way they should. So, mm. on the side of the weak, we are on the side of the poorer, and we are on the side of the people who might lose politically. But in being uh, so humanitarian, so to speak, are you not, as a country, also exposing yourself to too much danger? 
Well, it's not a, an, a, a it's not a danger, but uh, of course, uh, when you have so many refugees or you have a big border, a very long 900 kilometers border with Syria, it becomes an issue. And uh, as I, our neighborhood is uh, is volatile, and uh, we have wars going around Turkey, and uh, it's not easy. But what can you do? I mean, they came to. Uh, come, they want to have security, they want to have safe, safety for their lives. You can't just say, no, I'm not taking these people in. Mm. That's why uh, we had to take them in. Of course, uh, it created a terrorism uh, issue. And, uh, uh, but uh, in the last two years, it has been uh, pretty... We managed to control our borders and now we are doing, uh, you know, some control uh, in uh, northern Syria, and so it seems that uh, it's okay. Let, let's come back home. Um, w one of uh, Turkey's, um, if you like, selling points for many people in Ghana I mean, who have never been to Turkey will be your airline industry. The yeah. Turkish Airlines is booming you know, with business does not have even a single airplane to boost off. Uh, recently, one of the newspapers reported that um, uh, Turkey would be willing, Turkish Airlines specifically, would be willing to support Ghana to you know, revive its airliner. You are Turkish government's representative here. Is this an idea that can come to life? Well, I think uh, this is now from different circles, and uh, and I, I believe that uh, Ghanaian authorities are also discussing this uh, with other airlines. So uh, I wish it could come true, but of course it's a delicate issue, and there are so many stakeholders. So they have to make a better, best decision for Ghana. Mm. We, I can understand that, but Turkish Airlines is a credible partner. And uh, Turkish Airlines is the only airline uh, who has uh, more than 50 flying 52 destinations in Africa, and uh, this is it's a strong. Uh, they have a strong uh, network, and uh, it has been growing. Uh, so I hope this can come true, and of course we will support it if uh, if if there is the ground for. Uh, having a national airline, f uh, helping mm. Ghana to have a national airline, that would be a tremendously good thing. Mm. Uh, let's look at uh, the area of exports and imports and Turkey. And I find a lot of Ghanaians patronizing Turkish airlines, um, but ending up in other countries because they only transit at uh, the Istanbul airport. What is it that is that most unique selling point that instead of transiting at Turkish Airlines to go and do business, I mean, at the Turkish airports to go and do business in other countries and then come back through the airport just to get back home, that they end up in Turkey, Ghana, I, I mean, come back to Ghana and so on. What is it? No, I think it's changing, though, because uh, there are many Ghanaians, uh, they just go to Turkey, they buy things. I, I'm just talking about the suitcase trade. Mm. They uh, they buy things and they come over here and uh, because the quality of the uh, textiles, especially, is good and uh, competitive prices. So they do that. And I think there are more and more uh, Ghanaians. They discover Turkey, uh, and it's a it's an advantage that we have a daily flight and we also have twice cargo service from Ghana to Turkey and vice versa. So it's a good opportunity. And of course, we want our uh, bigger investors to come to Ghana also. That's mm. what I'm, I have been working mm. on in mm. the last year or so. And you will see more Turkish investors coming okay. soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, all this while, I've been asking you about Turkey, Turkey. But when you meet your Turkish counterparts, your comrades in Turkey. Oh. Uh, I think uh, th some people already have uh, an idea of Ghana. Of course, uh, people know of Kofi Annan. And mm. uh, there was also this uh, one, uh, at one stage they said that uh, President Obama's wife is related to Ghana and <laughs> things like this <laughs> in yeah. the press. And of course, I think we have over 
3,500 Ghanaians living in uh, in Turkey, as far as I know, and uh, there are many uh, projects going on. So uh, promote yourself better in mm. Turkey, also mm. like mm. we are trying mm. to promote mm. ourselves in Ghana. So, uh, but I think Ghanaians are n uh, not known with uh, mischievous behavior or anything like that. Unlike some other nation, <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It is. And I think uh, it's. It's people are getting more about Ghana, and uh, I hope uh, you promote more your country. All right. Um, before we uh, close, let's let's get back to the main uh, reason why, you know, which is the coup d'état. It's two years on. Has Turkey taken steps, concrete steps, to ensure? that even when people have grievances, there are ways through which they can express those grievances. And that the sitting government, whoever it is, whether it's President Erdogan or any other person, will listen to the grievances of such persons and address these grievances in order to prevent other persons, maybe in the future, might want to circumvent the democratic process. Mm. Well, I think uh, there are enough mechanisms to secure that situation that this will not uh, happen again. And it's not a, I mean, a, at this time and stage uh, in this century, uh, you don't uh, have coups like that uh, in some European uh, country mm. or in Asian country, not like that. It's not. Uh, but uh, of course, the important thing is that and lifting of a uh, state of emergency is a very positive thing. So people will be able to seek if they have some uh, grievances to remedy them. Oh, and they can, uh, there will be mechanisms open to European courts and there will be mechanisms to open higher courts. I mean, if they feel that they have been mistreated or maltreated, whatever. So uh, it will be, I think uh, this is, I mean, nothing is for sure. But uh, I about having another uh, coup attempt in Turkey in the uh, foreseeable future. That's mm. my personal uh, perception. I, I, I wish Your Excellency would move beyond perception and tell me, well, you are part of the government. What are the steps? Yes, um, the state of emergency will be lifted. But can you also assure people that there will be no victimiz uh, uh, victimization or already there is a perception out there because of reports in some happenings in Turkey. They may not be right, but the perception is out there. Yeah, I know. I know perception is there, and I know you, you are getting your news through BBC or CNN or whatever. And then I think people should also look into other uh, resources, source of uh, news. There are other uh, agencies one could also look. But uh, again, the thing is, uh, I mean, uh, we don't uh, believe everything you hear in the press, do you? You have to question it. And uh, of course, Turkey, uh, especially uh, getting a uh, very bad press from uh, Western uh, big houses, media houses. Uh, but I mean, it, it's not an issue. It, that's their perception, and they just they, they do it the same. Look at Russia, what sort mm. of press mm. Russia is getting. Look at China, what sort of press uh, they are getting. Do they really deserve it? One has to question all these things. It's just a matter of, you know, and uh, of course, if you look at the Turkish press, you will see USA is getting bad. It's a matter of, you know, uh, the what the society is, I mean, uh, wha wha what do they think and how the uh, media tries to shape opinions, inf influence the opinions. So uh, I think we have to look, uh, look at the ground, not only to the news. Mm. And um, maybe uh, Ghanaian journalists should visit Turkey more so uh, sure. we, 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 we can see what is there. And instead of depending on point of view, we can report directly and tell uh, our public what it is that is on the grounds there. Your Excellency, thank That's you very much. Idea. Thank you very much for uh, you. accepting our invitation. Yeah, it's been a very insightful uh, conversation with you. Um, if you have some of your Turkish citizens watching us right now, what would you want to tell them? 
Uh, well, I would like to tell them that uh, we are in Ghana. When we live here, we live uh, in our country individually. It's not only the ambassador, they are all ambassadors mm -hmm. of Turkey. So I wish they will show only good face of Turkey and uh, just, uh, you know, be, uh, be uh, respectful to the uh, regulations, laws, and whatever, and then uh, be friends with the Ghanaians. That will be my message. Thank you very much, uh, you. Your Excellency you. Nesrin Bayazit, uh, Turkish ambassador to Ghana. We've been talking uh, two years after the failed coup attempt, and uh, she has been explaining to us uh, how Turkey has uh, gathered itself and you know gotten out of uh, the a tremor that uh, that attempted coup may have caused in the country. She says uh, the economy wasn't really affected, but it's really uh, doing well as we speak. Uh, there is absolute peace in Turkey, and she says Ghanaians are invited to do business in Turkey, just as business persons to do business in Ghana. She's been telling us about the Turkish foreign policy as well. It says peace at home and peace abroad. That is the message from Turkish founder uh, Atatürk himself. Thank you very much for being a part of the show tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow when we bring you another edition of Moment Tonight. Have a very good night. Bye-bye. This is Moment Tonight. Welcome. Many thanks for joining us. We bring you the real stories. <laughs> <laughs> My environment alone will tell you that I'm rich. I've chosen to be one of the very shallow persons. They also do have miscreants, but it doesn't mean that all of them are criminals. We do not have a good geo database of our mineral resources. This is a time for us to share the oil money. They see them coming here and going back to the king. But God willing, I'll be back alive. We are just about leaving on the night patrol with the AU forces here in Somalia. The real issues, the real talk. We are working together for the development of Ghana. It means that we have separation of powers. Really, we're talking about moving from what? 9% to 6.5%. The critical challenge that faces every leader in the world today is the issue of creating jobs. We will put at least 1 million people to work. Ghana, after 16 years, has a public structure that is not responsive. Join me at the high moment. The men tonight from Monday to Friday. 9.15 p.m. on GBC 24.